Hello, and thank you for joining me once again. You know, the other day I was praying in the Spirit, and the Lord began to give me a word that I knew was for tonight. I have several ministries that I do uh, each week, different locations, and each one has a different message or different, um, I'm going to say sermon, teaching. But I knew that this one was for here, for you. I'm so glad that God divides that out and shows me exactly where they are to go. So tonight, the words that he began to give me as I was praying in the Spirit were rise up, rise up. And I want to talk tonight, my message in title obviously will be rise up. I want to talk about what God showed me in my spirit about our responsibility to arise. Let's get right into the scripture tonight. Um, there was a, a, a healing sometimes that needs to take place among the body of Christ. You see, victory belongs to God's children. Victory of healing, victory of, of uh, finances. Yeah, I said it. Victory of finances. We can have that victorious life even in our finances. Make sure you have read Malachi chapter 3 for tithes because that's a big portion of how the victory comes. But we can also have victory in our healing and in our jobs. There is a victorious life that can be led, but we must rise up and obey the Lord. I want to give you, a, before we go straight into the word, I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about tonight. I was uh, one of those folks that I guess I would have been categorized as those who would say, well, I'm not able. I don't know enough. Um, I'm not qualified. <clears throat> there, are, there are times in our lives when God's going to ask us to do something that Wait a minute, I, I'm not qualified. You must be talking to somebody else, Lord. I had for about seven years been teaching a new converts class, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but I knew that I was to write the curriculum for that new converts class. So uh, each week I would work on the curriculum and refine it for the next week and so forth. And this was a new converts class where it was done in cycles. So those who had gotten saved to receive the Lord or were wanting to join the church would come into this series of teaching that we did. And then they could go out into other adult classes uh, and continue to learn. But there was a nurturing time that needed to take place up front for the new converts. I wrote the material and I kept it in outline form. You know, one of those Roman numeral one, da da da, A dot B dot. Simple, easy material. I knew how to fill in the blanks. After all, I had written it. So it, for me, it was just comfortable. Well, after about seven years, the Lord woke me up real early one morning and said, write the book. Write the book. I knew he was talking about that curriculum. I knew. I, it may have been five in the morning, but I knew what he was talking about. And I didn't want to write any book. I never saw myself as an author. I didn't want to be an author. I, I was now retired, and I was really kind of enjoying that. Write the book. Lord, you know, uh, I, I'm not an author. I've never written one. And you know what that material looks like. It's just Roman numeral one, A, B, C, Roman numeral two, A, B, C. We're just talking little sentences, Lord. I don't know how to write a book. If you're talking a book, you're talking paragraphs and chapters. Write the book. I said, Lord, you know I don't like grammar because I figured a book needed to be in good grammar. 
I'm sorry, all you English teachers out there. I made A's in English, but I still didn't want to be an author. Write the book. Finally, I submitted. And the Lord began to show me the right publisher for that moment in time and things that it, to how to do it. And the day that I released Echoes from God, a Christian study book for growing deep, growing strong in the faith for the new converts. That very afternoon, I, I talked to the publisher and that afternoon, after I had told them to put it to press, go ahead, I'm through editing, I'm through doing everything, you put this to press. The very afternoon, here's what God told me. It's two or three sentences, and they were spoken so clear into my spirit that it's like he took a pen and wrote it on my heart, never, ever to be forgotten. Every word. You are to get this book into the hands of men and women whom I shall call who are in faraway and remote lands and due to their remoteness and poverty, they may never get the Christian training that I want them to have. Now, folks, I may fuss and the Lord knows each one of us and our character, but I will obey. I did write the book. God helped me. He showed me the words. He showed me how to do it. He showed me the publisher. I could do it. I may or may not want to, but I could do it. Now, get something in your head. I am retired as a school principal. I'm a wife, mother, grandmother. I was enjoying my life. And the Lord, in this one sentence, totally threw my life out of whack. I became, for the first time ever, I guess, it was like I was angry at God. You want me to do what? Go to far away and remote lands? Lord, you know I'm married. I'm retired. Look at me. I'm an old lady. Lord, you must be talking to somebody else. I knew he wasn't. He was talking to me. But I said, Lord, in all these years, and here was what frustrated me. In all these years, Lord, I've always tried to obey you. Always. I, even if I fussed first, I got up, I rose up, and I obeyed. But this one, Lord, you have put me in a situation where I don't think I can obey you. I don't know how to go to far away and remote lands. And what will my husband Jack say? He, as far as he knows, when he left for work this morning, he had a retired housewife that was happy at home. How, or in my, how is that going to be, Lord? You're going to have to tell him. I sat down at the computer and I wrote a, a close friend of mine, Steve, who was a missionary in Kenya. And I said, Steve, this is what the Lord told me. And I wrote everything down. How can I possibly obey God? Steve writes back to my surprise. He says, oh, that's easy. You just need to get a hold of Mr. So-and-so. I said, who is Mr. So-and-so? He sends a letter. Mr. So-and-so was in Kenya. An American on missionary tour to Kenya at that moment. He sends a letter to him by email introducing him, my, me to him. As soon as he got back, Mr. So-and-so and my husband and I sat down at, t at the table in Keller, Texas. Turns out he lived about two miles from our daughter. And we sat there and his parents had started a missionary program in Kenya. And they were uh, now retired, but he had taken over the entire program. 
one of the things that they did and that he did was to ship big cargo shipments of resources, books, and Bibles to the pastors of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Romania, that whole region. They had a burden for pastors and they knew that there were no resources for these pastors in these far away and remote lands. So they held trainings for them. That day before we left, my husband and I, not knowing where the money would come, but we did, we, God brought it in. We committed 500 books to him. He was thrilled. But then he looked at me and he said, that's good. They will love it. However, nothing would be better than if you came with us and you spoke to those pastors. I said, I'm sending the book and no, but, but thank you. He said, well, that's too bad. I really would like for you to come. I go home and still feeling kind of proud of myself and even wonder how we're going to pay for 500 books. I go to bed that night and the Lord wakes me up and he said, I said, you are to get the books into the hands. And I knew he was sending me. I got up that next morning and called him and I said, is that still offer for me to go on? He said, just been waiting. I made six trips to Kenya. We gifted over 6,400 books in four years. I saw over 6,000 pastors, pastors leadership conferences. I'm an old retired mother, housewife, grandmother, now an ordained minister. I didn't see it coming. I would have said I'm too little, too small, too old, not enough. God didn't want any of that. He wanted me to rise up and obey. Rise up and obey. Wow. He had the rest of it. Some of those trips cost $20,000. Time we put on every conference and fed every pastor. Every penny came in. And I never made a pull from any direction. I had people that said, I want to be a part of what's going on. Here, here's a $5,000 check. Here, here's a $7,000 check. And here, here's $25. Here's $50. I never asked for money from anybody. God brought it in. Paid for every book. Paid for every trip. Tremendous, tremendous healings and and miracles took place at every trip. The only thing he ever asked me to do was to rise up and do it. He took care of everything. When you began to think you're too small, don't have enough, you don't know enough. Well, it's just not the way it works in God's kingdom. Let's look at an example in the book of Mark. Mark 14 12 through 16. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that we may eat the Passover? I want you to listen to the details of the answer. And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you there. Be carrying a pitcher of water, follow him. Jesus, at that moment, he gave them where to go. He told them the city. And he said, now, there's going to be a man, and you're going to follow him. They didn't have to go wandering throughout the city. He said, this man's going to come your way. He'll be coming toward you carrying this pitcher of water. You just follow him and go in the building that he goes in. Verse 14. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, 
Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Now watch this. When he sent those two, he said, now you're going to um, say this and ask this. God gave them the words. Did you know God gave me the words? This entire book came right from here. God gave me the words. God gave them the words. God gives us the questions and the answers, the sentences, the conversation. The only thing he needs is our body to get up and do what he said. Those two disciples had to get up and walk to that city. He told them where, he told them who, he told them what to do once they found that person. He told them what to say, and he told them what to ask. Wow. That doesn't leave a lot for us, does it? Just obey. Verse 15. Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. I told you that when we went over there, some of those conferences cost $20,000. God paid for every penny. If God is going to do it, when God puts the order out, it's covered. Look at that. Furnished and prepared. Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. Verse 16. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. The only thing those two disciples had to do was to get up on their feet and do what he told them. Mark 14, 27 through 31. Watch this one. This is where Peter is about to deny Jesus, and Jesus is telling him about it. Verse 27, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after that, after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. All right. There's a piece in this conversation that I don't think those disciples were really paying attention to. They listened to the first part, and we quit listening sometimes before the whole sentence comes out. Sometimes we hear the very first part, and then we go, and we stop. There was good news at the end of this conversation, but I'm not sure they really paid attention. He said, I will go before you to Galilee. He told them where he was going to be. He told them where they could find him. After the three days, this is where I'll be. I'll be in Galilee. They got so busy with, you're all going to be scattered. You're going to deny me. Wow. So, Peter. Watch old Peter. Peter says, Assuredly, let's see, let me find it here. Peter says, verse 29, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I'll not be made. Lord, you know, they may do it, but you can count on me. Oh, pride, folks, is a bad thing to have. Lay it aside. Listen to what Jesus said, and you wouldn't have to fall into that trap of pride. Verse 30, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before that rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If, if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. And they all said likewise. Peter had quickly begun to defend his own reliability. F folks, our reliability is not what we are to rely upon. The Bible says, don't lean on your own understanding. Peter was leaning on his own reliability, and it will fail you every time. You lean upon Jesus. 
Listen to what he says. Don't make your own ways. Do what he says. Those two disciples while ago, they would not have found the Passover room if they had decided to just wander around and do their own thing. What they did was exactly what Jesus told them to do. Let's look at another situation along that very same line. And this is when Moses is about to lead the Israelites out. God is calling Moses and he's telling him a lot. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3, 19 through 22, New King James Version. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. Now this is God talking to Moses. No, not even by a mighty hand. But so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So shall you plunder the Egyptians. Now I know Moses was in the presence of God and God was talking to Moses. I don't know if that moment Moses grasped the entire picture of what God was doing. See, God was painting a picture. Let me show it to you. Here's this group going out and their hands are full. He said, you're not going to go out like this empty handed. No, you're going to go out like this. And he says that every woman shall ask of her neighbor, those who real close by, she's going to ask for their silver and their gold and their clothing. Wow. But we know God had favor and they gave it to him, gave it to the women. And then what did it say? The women, it says, put these on your sons and daughters. They're going to walk out wearing those clothes, maybe some jewels around their neck. The children were involved as well as the women, as well as the men. What I'm getting across here, God doesn't leave anybody out in the work of the Lord. No one, children, women, men, no one are left out of this. Everyone had a role in the exit. Everyone had a role in the rise up and obey. What if the children had said, I don't want to put that on? Or the women said, I don't want to go knock on doors. Or the men said, we're not leaving. You see, in order to get the blessing of the Lord, we have to obey. I had no idea the blessings that would come in my life simply by starting out with write the book. I had no idea. I still don't know what all God's doing because he just keeps opening another door. Sometimes it's doors I had no clue they weren't even on my radar. Believe me, Kenya wasn't on my radar either. Uganda, Australia, Philippines, none of those were on my radar, but I've sure been there multiple times. God does not intend to let anyone be left out of the blessing. He blessed them with everything that the Egyptians had in the house. And they, everyone had a role in carrying it out. Now then, <clears throat> God would use, would give them traveling and startup money through this, I believe. You see, um, if they needed any money, well, they had silver and they had gold and that's what they bartered with. They had clothing, that's what they bartered with. Whatever they needed, they were ready. Let, um, this leads me into the next piece, 2 Corinthians 8 and 12. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has, 
and not according to what one does not have. That morning, 5 a.m. in the morning, I'm busy arguing with God. I don't have an acceptable mind. And we know that wouldn't be accepted, by the way, by God. I must first have an acceptable mind. In other words, this whole journey that I began, that, that began in mine and my husband's life, none of it would have taken place until my mind had become acceptable to do what God said. When God called me into full-time ministry, I could have had a not acceptable mind. I could have said, no, God always gives you that choice, but your life will never be as full as if you had obeyed the obedient child. I had no clue. My husband had no clue of the, the journey that we would embark upon as husband and wife, as minister, as my right hand, as, as God would open. Since then, there's been another book written, The Long, Long Night, the study of the book of Esther. God said to write that. These are journeys that God is just opening doors. But it was because I had a willing mind, not necessarily in the very beginning. And if you don't, if you've been arguing with God, stop. Begin to say, yes, sir. I have no clue how you want me to do it. But my answer will be yes, sir, because see, it said, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what you don't have. I didn't think I was an author. I didn't think I was a minister. And I sure didn't think I was a traveler to foreign countries, far away in remote lands. But I was a child of God. I was his daughter and I knew to obey. So I gave him my willing mind. And from that, an entire world has opened. He will do it for you tonight. I believe he gave me this message, rise up. It's all the beginning of that message that poured in my spirit for this program tonight. Rise up. Will you say, yes, sir, I surrender all. I'll do what you want me to do. What doors that you don't know of open up? I'll see you next week. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed Kingdom Ministries with Reverend Dee Levins. For more from Dee, read The Long, Long Night, The Story of Destiny, and Echoes from God, a Christian study book for growing deep and strong in the faith. Connect with Dee and purchase her books at dlevins.com. Send an email to dlevinstv at gmail.com or text Dee at 254-681-6099.